Uh, did you feel inferior after today's uh, summit, Boris Johnson? Uh, no, I, fe I felt in no way inferior. I thought it was a very, very um, impressive, impressive summit. And good luck to all these, these bright, thrusting young designers who've had the luck to be, to be patronised by Peter Mandelson and, and invited to display their wares. All I, all I would say about the whole kind of style thing is that it seems a bit, a bit rum, um, you know, to claim this is some sort of labour triumph. All these people, you know, like... Um, Eddie Izzard and so forth, these alternative comedians, these designers, these brilliant software experts, these were all thrown up by the Thatcher revolution. It was Thatcher policies that produced uh, this fantastic flowering of culture and talent. Now Labour now Labour tries to get its leg <laughs> Labour tries to get its leg over the whole thing in a typical sort of uh, socialist uh, well, a corporatist a way. Minute, Got to take a bit of issue on that. I don't think I was thrown up by the uh, Thatcher government, was it? I mean I don't Your really the think creation of Thatcher, it's thanks to yuppie culture that people were able to Hang on. reach into right. the No, I think it was Attila the Hun that pay created pay the alternative comedians, they, for alternative as much as uh, Margaret Thatcher. I mean, foreign, right. policy, foreign policy um, with the French until today was sort of rather like, you know, sitting on the white cliffs of Dover and making Churchillian signs to our, our, our friends on the continent. That was the sum total of sort of Tory foreign policy. I think but we've seen a bit of difference so you here do today. Think, you, mean, you buy this argument that there's a new kind of relationship, do you? I think there should oh, be. Of course, it takes a long time to build a really yeah. solid and deep relationship, but I think we've actually made a pretty good start. And considering what we've suffered over the last 18 years, where we've positively sneered at our, our colleagues and friends on the continent of Europe, I think this is a real departure, and it's very important because yeah. it's going to be good for Britain as a whole. I think you've got to, I mean, you've got to start somewhere. You know, you've got to, if, if it's seen as being a bad relationship, which I think is a media thing, and also, I mean, people suddenly forgot, what about the Scottish and English relationship, especially at football time? You can get this huge hatred, so-called, between the Scottish and English, which suddenly gets forgotten now. Actually, it's an English-French thing. Oh, what about the Germans? That's there. And then the Germans and the Dutch, they right. don't really get on with each other. I mean, it's... OK, we're going to talk about the English-French relationship in a second, but uh, uh, so we're going to look more specifically at the politics. First of all, the question, uh, the relationship that, that, that here are Blair and Jospin, two allegedly socialist prime ministers, and Blair is saying to Jospin, sort out your lorry drivers. I mean, this is a very odd kind of two very odd ideas of socialism, aren't they? No, why, why do we immediately try and point out the difference between them? We've got a situation where there's a this dispute a in front. You're singing from the labor new Labour accenture no, with the positive a song sheet, aren't you? No, a dispute in France, which we've seen very clearly, affects many other countries, not just ourselves. And it's absolutely understandable that they're going to talk about it. And quite frankly, I'd rather have Tony Blair and Lionel Jospin doing the diplomacy than the, the Mr. Hay with his present, uh, Euro well, sceptical European policies I trying to, to do the, the diplomacy. Possible, the greatest possible respect to Mr. Blair. I don't think he's going to make a blind bit of difference to this lorry dispute in France. Whatever he says to Monsieur Jospin, this is entirely for domestic consumption, this Blair, you know, ring, you know rings Jospin's withers thing. No, this is, not. He's not going to make a blind bit of difference. Old Jospin is, you know, is probably going to capitulate to the, to the, to the lorry drivers anyway. Oh, I'd, I'd like to say, I, just, I don't know whether it will make a huge amount of difference. I think it's quite good that he thinks that he can go and talk to him, though. That's sort of better than before, where we just thought, oh, let's not even bother mm, talking to them. Absolutely. Well, hang uh, on, I think, hang on, I think we're getting a slight caricature of the last 18 years developing here. I mean, I, th I thought, thought actually British diplomacy worked rather well. We had the single market, we invented, joking, the, we, invented, we invented the single market, we brought you know, that's right reforms the whole of the whole of the community, didn't we? Europe handbagging, handbagging no, hand hand our, our our friends hand and colleagues. If you call, if mean, you call it handbagging, her triumph in retrieving <laughs> two billion pounds of our money. If you'd rather hand that money back, cost, Carol, what about this, a very high cost. What about the style of this 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 summit? I mean, clearly it was it was it was quite clear that some of those French journalists were were not really taken in by it. Um, were you impressed? by this attempt to take on the French at their own game in things like uh, food and design and so on? I thought it, I, well, I like, I thought it was very cool, actually. I did like, I like that kind of um, orgasmatron type thing they had on the wall with the strobing pastel lights that um, was done from a shop called Space in the Portobello Road. I thought it, I thought it, was, it was genuinely in innovative and interesting. Um, what I sort of wondered was, you know, it was all about promoting a certain very narrow band of British designers. This is and about rebranding Britain. It's about, yeah. it's about representing Britain to, to the outside world. And apparently, this is going to keep on happening every time there's a summit. What do you think of it? Well, I, th I think in the areas that we sort of need to uh, work on, on things, you, know, you know, like if, if our cooking is perceived to be bad consistently, um, uh, do we need to look at that? I mean, or do we need to sort of up, uh, uh, present up the, the people who are re really excellent chefs in this country? 
you know, there's sometimes it's just, it is a sort of presentation thing, and you're just trying to put over the fact that we might have got better, like our football. We did used to think that we were brilliant at it, and that we had the whole thing, and then the, the Europeans got very good at it, and now we're learning the European way, and, it, and it, it's got a lot I don't better. I think you said if you're a Manchester United fan, but never mind. Let's but, I mean, move the French on. have always been good at asserting their cultural excellence. Why shouldn't we do the same? We're absolutely brilliant okay. in design, such a, in film. Such a narrow band. Hang on a second, people. Boris. I'm sorry, sorry. Now, when it comes to France, the old cliché is true. It is a love-hate relationship. Most of the British elite fawn on all things French, from their countryside to their foie gras. The rest of the country trusts the French as far as they can throw them. France is, after all, the country which blew up Greenpeace's Rainbow Warrior, still thinks Johnny Halliday is cool, hasn't produced a decent novel for decades, and has to turn increasingly to British designers to save their fashion houses. Yet, for all that, they still think themselves superior. Fiona Bruce has been wondering why. Preparing a BBC documentary. <laughs> the Americans will always protect us from the Russians, won't they? Russians? Who's talking about the Russians? Well, the independent deterrent. It's to protect us against the French. <laughs> <laughs> they are allies, our partners. Well, they are now. <laughs> but they've been our enemies for most of the past 900 years. <laughs> and if they got the bomb, we must have the bomb. Well, if it's for the French, of course that's different. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. Yes, can't trust the frogs. Oh, say that again. And let's face it, that's what a lot of us think. Can't trust them, and don't like them much either. Malcolm Scott, author of I Hate the French, gives his reasons. Sasha D. Stell, two-pronged plugs, because they like Benny Hill, the Hundred Years' War. It seems the French, more than any other nation, are the ones we love to hate. Single-ply toilet paper. It's because we're very close neighbours. We can see each other, you know, and yet we're so different. And this breeds a lot of distrust. And we have, at various stages in our history, been mortal enemies. And uh, my grandmother, for instance, was put to bed as a girl, you know, in 1870 or something, with the words, get to sleep now or bony will get to you. Whenever you ask the English about the French, it's a fair bet you'll still hear some of the same old clichés, which all basically boil down to the same thing. France would be all right if it wasn't for the French. It's a kind of venerable tradition, this dislike of the French. After all, we've been at war with them pretty much on and off since the Middle Ages. The Miserable may be one of London's most popular musicals, but when it's set in 1815, the Duke of Wellington was busy seeing off the French at the Battle of Waterloo. More recently, you might think that the Second World War, when the French were our allies, might have done something to forge a rapprochement. But even then, we still found plenty to blame them for. Never been really my favourite. I'm actually, although we had the war with Germany both times, I prefer them as a type of person to trust instead of the French. I was very much involved in the war, and therefore um, my recollections are obviously um, dated from that time. And we personally felt that. Um, they just jacked it in and left us to it. Former policy advisor to Margaret Thatcher, Charles Pohl often acted as a buffer between the French and his mistress's famously vigorous approach to diplomacy. He believes the two countries have still failed to put the past behind them. They're the two oldest, most established nation states. They have the longest continuous history. They have the only nuclear deterrents in Europe. They're, they're bound to be rivals. Now, it should be a a cooperative rivalry, if I can put it like that. They should be able to find a way to work together. In fact, it's been a bit disappointing that, in practice, they haven't worked together as well as they should. But what about the younger generation? At the Lycée Francais in London, with 3,000 French pupils, surely the old rivalries must be dying out with this breed of new Europeans. But these sixth formers studying for their baccalaureate still feel there's more antipathy between the English and the French than between any other nations. At the school, I mean, it's exactly the same thing, you know? You've got a French and an English section. Well, you can go over there at the lunchtime, and you'll see French people on the left, right, English people. And that's how it stays. I think the main difference is that the English eat to live, whereas the French live to eat, live for the food. The English don't. It's just another formality for them to eat. For example, you go and eat down to a pub. I mean, they're going to serve you, what, eggs thrown into burning oil and with a big, fat lump of lard in it. I mean, that's not cuisine, you know? That's like barbarism at its first stage, you know? 
But some claim British cuisine is fast catching up. Britain's latest hot chef has just been awarded a Michelin star. Okay, he is French, but he claims he learned it all here. And I remember somebody say, um, you've got to go there. And I said, yeah, but this, this cooked steak and marmalade. And in no way he told me, well, you can't go that, that, <laughs> you can't go that, 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 that bad from starting to, to that. And actually end up to a very good establishment in UK and actually learn how to cook. We're hot on the heels of the French, right. culturally speaking, with food and fashion. And then, of course, we're doing our best to force the French to speak English. Otherwise, how can we understand them? Of course, the French are very much on the defensive about their culture. After all, they must see it surrounded by the ever-spreading Anglo-American culture, uh, much of which they, they dislike. They see their language under threat. That, I think, contributes to making the French rather more prickly than many of our other natural allies. So that's, that's part of the competitiveness. They're, they're competing, if you like, to keep their culture alive, to keep French as a world language. I think it's a losing battle, I have to say. When you're a star... But when it comes to philosophy, so to poetry, the French are fighting a rearguard action, most famously embodied in Eric Cantona, self-styled, intellectual, and all-round Renaissance uh, man. Before time, it's not the right time. Neither is it the right time after the time. Can this age-old rivalry between the English and the French ever end? Not everyone wants it to. I don't think it will, it will ever change. And I don't wish it will change, because that provoke a competition between the two countries. The fact is that we enjoy these tensions with the French. It's, it's a um, pastime that keeps both of us happy, you know, pointing, each other's, pointing out each other's weaknesses. And uh, it's, it's a healthy rivalry based on equality. You know, we, we are equals and we can be rude about each other uh, without you know, shedding any blood about it. Perhaps this clip from Have I Got News For You a fortnight ago sums up how the English view the French. There's actually nothing uh, <coughs> new in creating headless frogs, is there? Because we've been doing it since, uh, well, the French Revolution, really. <laughs> And of course, uh, the spineless one since around 1940. <laughs> but when people wrote in to points of view about it, it wasn't a complaint. They just wanted to hear it again. I was reduced to tears of laughter. It was fantastic. His jokes about the French were measured and took humour to the limits, but not beyond. I used to go out with it's a girl. A tribute, was, uh, well, she, she was half French. She was half French, half English. Weird woman, shaved under one arm. <laughs> I'm sorry if there's anyone here who's French, but I don't like you. <laughs> um, Eddie Izzard, do you agree with your fellow comedian? Uh, no. <laughs> Quite so. Well, you know, it's... I worked this thing out that, um... It's so, I mean, I was mentioning earlier, it's so simple to dislike. It's an easy way of making yourself feel good. It's like gossip. Gossip is when you say, have you heard about so-and-so? God, terrible things happen to them. And you feel good without having to do any work at all. That is what it comes from. That's what... This is like racism, but you haven't got people of different sc skin colours there. You've just got people of different countries. And you, we did it with the Scots. When, when we're having a football match or whatever, we can always go English-Scots when we want to. And then we can say, oh, no, well, actually, we're together, there's the French there. Then the Scots get on better with the French. Or then there's a, We can do it however we wish to do it. When the German Bundesbank starts getting up or something, like that. We'll say, actually, we've got a big problem with the Germans, and then it's the French, and then it's the Germans. If the Dutch had a bigger country, we'd have a problem with them. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> however you want to cut it. Yeah, the but people in the next street, you can hate the people in the next street. It's as simple as that, as big as your imagination or as small as your imagination. But there is a specific problem w with the French. I mean, I don't, do you ever read Robert Grace's Goodbye to All That? He, I mean, he, in several First World War books, about this, they spent years fighting alongside the French as their allies and ended up liking the Germans, whom they were supposed to be doing to mortal death much more than they like their allies. What, they or he? No, we did. The, the English did. Well, generally. I mean, that's a big sweeping generalisation. Well, he it did it's in counted his time and time again. What do you think it is, Boris? Well, I, I don't know, but I think, you, I think Eddie's obviously right that you can't have xenophobia towards anybody. But I think there is something particular about the French, and there are reasons why, you know, there are, we have diplomatic difficulties with them, as, as old uh, Charles Poe was saying. They basically have been beaten 
uh, very, very heavily by the Germans in three times in 80 years. And it's led them, left them with a kind of Vichyite uh, approach to foreign policy. They tend to want to suck up to the Germans, to get in with the Germans, if possible, to put their officials like this chap, Trichet, who's going to be, who they want to be head of the, of the Euro Bank, and, and, and do it that way. They don't have any particular confidence in their, in their national okay, independence. That's abuse, of the, that's abuse of the French. But what I'm getting at is why, why you think the English dislike the French. Well, do they dislike they the do. French? I think, well, it's possibly the rage of Caliban, isn't it? We feel, you know, ah. we are French, aren't we? We're basically we were conquered exactly. by the French in 1966. Exactly. 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 It's a national psychosis about the thing. What happened? We got beaten at the Battle of Hastings, and, and they took over our culture and, 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 um, and you know, our women and so forth. That's and, exactly and the point. We are French. But now we say, no, we're not French, because the people who stayed there, they were French. But then it's all movements Hasn't of tribes Hasn't this just all been so whipped up and totally out of proportion? Yeah. I mean, no. I'm British. I love the French. I, I'm European. We've, we've got a problem with the fact that they've always been able to assert what is great about their, their culture, something that Charles Powell mentioned, that, yeah, of course, they're great at food, they're great at film, they're great they're at fashion. They're not great at food. They're not great at food yes, at all. French food is ex execrable. If you, if you go to a, if you go to a, a you know, a, a well, you've obviously just been eating than than Andouillette or stuffed pigs intestine, not a lot more, and there's well, a lot more to offer in France. Well, than, have you ever than, eaten Andouillette? It's not much fun, I can tell you. Yeah, but there's a lot more in French cuisine than, uh, French cuisine than that, and it's being facile to say that. I mean, it's, well, we've I just got to get beyond you're, this. You're, we've I'm had tabloids with, well. with pathetic xenophobic headlines, uh, which I just think are, are unbelievable. I mean, the rest yeah, of Europe looks at those newspapers and thinks, journalism. what's it's the problem the English okay, it's have got? It's an English problem, actually, it's Germany. Not it's, not a Scot it's, it's not a Scottish, it's not a Welsh it's problem. Curious. I mean, it's, it's an a, English it's problem because very, we very very don't know how to assert. It's a difference of political culture. The French are basically Vichyite. They like to capitulate. What do you mean Vichyite? They're talking about Vichyite. They're talking about Vichyite. They're self-confident, aren't they? Unbelievably unself-confident. When the railwaymen people went on strike, Edith Cresson said, that no French minister could leave Paris because she was so terrified that one of them would be lynched. They caved into the, you know, what is it, the, um, the airline workers, they caved into, they're, they're going to cave into these lorry, lorry strikers. They've got no... You've got, um, a, you've got a very a funny... Deal uh, on the lorry strikes. That's, that's, going, that's, that's yeah. being negotiated just to... Just I'm interested, you say, you say this is an English problem. There's a very, um, I couldn't understand, unfunny cartoon in Le Mans today, a picture of of Tony Blair and the, 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 the full Monty, the full European. I couldn't make head nor tail of it, but... Um, I mean, is it something that, there, there it is up on the wall now, um, whether it's funny or not, it's neither here nor there, but uh, is it the sort of thing that troubles the French, their relationship with the English? You spend a lot of time in France. No, they, they like us a lot more than we've, we've heard us not liking, liking them. They have profound respect for us. They have profound respect for our system of parliamentary democracy. They, oh yeah, and we don't hear any of this. They don't indulge in the in the kind of rhetoric we've heard you know the anti anti-english or anti-british well, rhetoric no they don't well, no they the don't they try listen, and ban I, our words not only do they try and ban our chocolate Boris, just hold on they a moment they try and ban our chocolate wait a minute wait a minute i was just they at a french film festival hang on a moment i was just at a french film festival now they pride themselves on having a great and strong and diverse industry all i heard over a whole weekend were plaudits for the full monty plaudits for brassed off P french people saying to me everywhere you know, your films are terrific. We love them. On the first day in Paris, The Full Monty had 12,000 people who went to see it, 80,000 in the rest of France. It's, it's going to take in more in France than it did in, than it did in this but country. I think Eddie, this thing, okay, they are a more second, open than we are. Eddie, at your experience, you, I mean, you performed recently uh, in Paris in, in French, or uh, Fr like, French and Franglais, maybe. No, right? I, I think it was Francais with a bit of Anglais. It was 95% <laughs> French by the end of it. Well, Franglais sounds like you're just going, I am a cat in a house, you know, and, and bonjour, je suis dans l'arbre, you know. But I, it ended up 95% French. It was 50-50 yeah. at the beginning and 95% French. And I just, I just pushed it. I've got O-level French. I'm just, I'm, I'm big into being a new European, you know, because the younger generations are growing up and they are European. It will be. It is the future. That's why I'm, I'm very positive on it. No one's actually defined what it is to be European. And, and my theory is that we're the great melting pot. If New York's a melting pot of however many million and, and 80 languages, we've got about 500 million potential and 200 languages. And if we ever work together, we'll come up with amazing things in, in Europe general, and the French and the English. We can all work together. We don't have to do... It's, it's an easy time to get on this, oh, we all hate each other. And it sort of comes around in some sort of conveyor belt of, oh, let's hate them again, or let's hate each other, or let's hate the people in the next street. The north and south of England can hate each other. We can hate the Welsh. Everyone, everyone can hate everyone. Or you can just look for the similarities. And I did the same material that I'm doing here as I do in, in Europe, and it gets the same laughs. And Bevan said, oh, it's such a different sense of humour. It isn't. It's just they love our different humor. senses of humour. They love our humour. 
it, it can swing. Mm. Maybe. You, you, you don't have to hate anybody at all. I mean, the only thing I notice is the French are rather nervous about the English language, and they, they'd like well, to try and ban every, They've I got every right to be. I understand it, imagine, well, imagine if, yeah. if the rest of the world was speaking French. Imagine if America spoke French. Exactly. And Australia, and Canada, and everyone was speaking French, and we just had English here. Well, what language do you imagine, this melting pot you're talking about, what language do you imagine it will end up speaking? God knows. Many languages, Jeremy. Language goes to the heart of your identity. I yes. mean, it's, it's, you know, from, from when you start to speak, you interpret the world through a language. It's incredibly important. And we can be terribly self-important about this and criticise the French for worrying about their language. They have every right to worry about their language. My experience in the European Parliament, so does everybody else. The Finns worry, the Portuguese worry. We've got to accept that we, we still... We don't worry about it. No, we don't. No, well, we it's don't. all right for us. Because we're lucky because we've got, we've got we've America. Got, yeah, we've, we've got, got the lingua America franca. There, I wish we'd get off the American of coattails sometimes. That's how others see us. Because they were going to choose German at one point. Well, the Americans apparently French, were going to choose German. gesture of solidarity. No, no, but just not expect everybody else all the time to speak our language. We should actually learn some other languages and actually make a gesture like Eddie All I was trying to say was it leads them into some somewhat absurd uh, no, postures like absurd. saying that uh, no. you can't, the Académie Française that you could, said you couldn't call a walkie-talkie a walkie-talkie, you had to call it a talkie-walkie. <laughs> and, and, um, oh, but you know what that is, that's their, that's their slang, isn't it, where they spin all the words around, that sort of... Oh, well, it's fine, it's fine. You're just, you're just getting but to the Lango. English have never tried to control their language. Never. Dr. Johnson, when he was wrote the dictionary, was never asked to exactly. We would if we were surrounded by it's French speaking in the rest of the world. Oh, we were surrounded by foreign languages then. I know, but they weren't all French. Okay. Yeah? It's typical of the French attempt to uh, impose state control. Right, let's on. move on.